bachelor's degree in speech communication at the University of the Philippines back here in 2013. Her research interests include indigenous cultures, performance, gender, migration, and digital humanity. So, uh, so the name of the presenters who will be present in these sessions as follows. Dr. Rosti Shangmi, Pranatha Bhattacharya, Sarchin Yaduvanshi, Salman Islevi, and Chumtong Murray. So I hand over the session to Professor Doris Nicholson. And you can go ahead. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the second technical session. And uh, welcome and uh, good afternoon from the Philippines. Magandang hapon in our language. So each speaker is given 10 minutes to share their uh, paper. And the questions, uh, you can post this on our chat box and it will be answered after all the speakers have uh, shared their ideas. And so without further ado, uh, before we start, I would request everyone except the presenters to please mute yourselves if you have not uh, done so. So let's start with the topic of uh, green identity, rereading Lepcha folklore. This will be presented by Dr. Rosie Chamling, uh, an associate professor of the Department of English, School of Languages and Literature at the Central University of Sikkim in India. Dr. Chamling. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, am I audible to all? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, good afternoon uh, to the organizers and to my fellow uh, participants. Uh, um, I would be basically talking upon uh, the topic greening identity, uh, rereading re lecture folk tales. Uh, I begin with the idea of how our conceptions of identity are always linked to our personal, social, and political theories of discourse. But seldom do we talk of the ecological dimensions of identity. Our current conceptions of identity are pre-ecological, pre meaning we envision identity and selfhood from a strictly human-centered perspective. Identities have or are fashioned in relation to human beings wherein the entire spectrum of the non-human environment goes missing. Social, social constructionist theorists talk of how our identities are constructed and defined through our interaction with other human beings. Now, the primary argument of what I'm of my paper would be to show how, uh, through a brief discussion of the lectures, who are an indigenous tribe of Sikkim and Darjeeling Hills, of how identities are inseparable from the non-human world. Greening identity would therefore imply a recognition that the ecology become that the ecology, like every other category of place, gender, uh, class, race, becomes an integral part of our identity. Now, now who are the lectures? J.C. White who was the first political officer of Sikkim during the period between 1888 to 1907, in his book Sikkim and Bhutan, page 7, writes that the aboriginal inhabitants of Sikkim are the lepchas and the language they use is lepcha. Their, or their origin is doubtful as they did not enter Sikkim across the Himalayas or from Tibet, but they are supposed to have come from the east along the foothills from the direction of Assam and Upper Burma. They bear little tip resemblance to the Tibetans, they are smaller and slightly built with finer cut features, in many cases almost Jewish, and the language is a distinct one, definitely not a dialect of Tibetan. Now, uh, although there are many opinions regarding their origin, but there is an absolute unanimous agreement on the, uh, on the assumption that the lectures are in, undisputably the original aborigines of Sikkim, whose identity is entirely derived from the majestic Mount Kanchenjunga and the two rivers flowing from it, Tista and Rangit. It has been observed that these lecture tribesmen have never migrated beyond Mount Kanchenjunga's shadow. It appears that the community have, has made a very conscious effort to always keep this majestic mountain in sight. It is rare to find a lepcha village from where the Kanchenjunga cannot be sighted. 
In fact, the Lepcha greeting actually refers to the salutation to the Kanchenjunga mountain. The annual festivals, uh, particularly the festival called Chu Ram Fat or Thanksgiving worship to the mountain gods is an integral part of the Lepcha ritual and is centered on, uh, and is centered on Mount Kanchenjunga. Since identities are products of particular places, it is interesting to see a close interconnectedness between the lectures and the physical environment. By, uh, recognize, by recognizing uh, the relationship uh, between, uh, between human beings and the environment, the lectures are more inclusively, rec uh, uh, they, they are more inclusive and they realize the ecologic self. Like all indigenous groups, the lectures consider the earth as a sentient being that takes various forms, mountains, rivers, lakes, birds, animals. Now, even if you look at the lecture creation myth, the first lecture primogenitors, uh, their Adam and Eve, so to speak, uh, they were Fadung Thing and Nuzang Yu, who were created by creator god Idbu Mu Ram out of the pure snows of Mount Kanchenjunga and sent down to live in the foothills of the Kanchenjunga and the land that they inhabit, the foothills of Mount Kanchenjunga, they call it the Mayal Yang, which translated means eternal country. Now, it is believed that the two rivers flowing down from the, mount, um, from the mountain, Rangyu and Rangit, were lovers who wanted to meet in the plain foothills uh, called Panzok, and today it is incorrect, uh, incorrectly pronounced as Peshok, which, uh, which is near a place called Tista. While River Rangit, the male, was guided by a bird, Tutfu, the River Rangyu, the female, was guided by a snake, Parilbu. As River Rangit was led by a bird, it traveled through circuitous routes in search of food. But the River Rangyu was traveling straight, so she was able to reach the appointed place first, which made Rangit feel embarrassed, crying out, Tista, meaning, when did you arrive? And that is how apparently the name river Tista, which is one of the primary river flowing down from the Mount Kanchenjunga through Sikkim, derives its name from. It is therefore believed that this is how the river Tista has, uh, you know, gets its name. Disappointed with Rangit decides to return to the Himalayas, a great deluge is supposed to have occurred in the land of the Lepchas Maya Yang. In order to save themselves from drowning, the Lepchas climbed out Mount Tendong and prayed once again to the creator, Idbumu. It is also believed that it was a partridge that saved the Lepchas from drowning. Each year, the Lepchas worship Mount Tendong not only for the protection of mankind, but for all human being, non-human beings as well. In their annual, in another annual festival called Tendul, uh, Tendong Ho Ram Rumfat, which is celebrated every year on uh, August 8, the lectures invoke the influence, uh, the, the usefulness of animals, birds, insects, and vegetation, and offer prayers to live in harmony with the non human world. These lecture myths and folklores are specimens of literature of sustainability through which the integral bond between man and nature are celebrated through rituals. Uh, we, uh, having gone through these folktales, we can see that destroy that these folktales destroy the hierarchical, hierarchical supremacy of human, a strong theme, which is a strong theme in the ecological, uh, eco, uh, eco critical theory, uh, that there has been uh, uh, eco critical theory, uh, which believes in the need to depart from the Cartesian tradition of dualism that separates the mind from the body and human humanity from the non human nature. Now, uh, uh, the lectures have always dissociated from the idea of the unitary self and of agency as an exclusively human attribute to perceptions of human individuals and societies as embedded parts of a larger material processes of exchange and flow. Now, in the process of identity formation, the natural environment acts as a catalytic agent to achieve psychic and, psychic and physical healing. Now, in fact, for the lectures, the non-human physical environment is so central to sustainable life. Their myths and folktales validate a sense of place and local knowledge. In a world rife with material economic considerations, the lectures have displayed a unique self-sufficiency through their close living with nature, wherein nature is no longer an anthropocentric uh, um, uh, in their worldview. Uh, in their worldview, their worldview is valued solely for its own use value. But rather, the non-human, the non-human, the portrayal of the non-human in most of these folk tales, uh, anthropo anthropopho uh, anthropopho of parallel universe reflecting back upon the human world. 
The speaking animals that we find, you know, in these folk tales are vested with wisdom, presenting a strong democratic natural scape. Uh, now, in these folk tales, we see that there is no element of hierarchy and no exploitation which is made exclusively for profit. It is a biocentric world. Biocentricism, which is a stance wherein the whole ecosystem affirms the value of all natural life. Uh, there are other, uh, there are other uh, for, um, myths called particularly the myth of Tal Lumpartam, which means making a way to go to heaven by constructing a stairway of earthen pots some 3,600 uh, 3, years ago. Uh, can still, the sorry to of, interrupt. The, yes, ma'am? You, you only have two minutes, so please start wrapping up your presentation. Okay, so um, uh, the lectures have their own animistic religion called booming thing, uh, booming thing and monism. Their religion is simple, centering on nature worship. The prayers are offered to Mother, uh, Mother Creator. However, today we see that a lot of lectures have converted to Christianity. Um, through these folk tales, through these folk tales, the lectures uh, are actually preserving their own habitats and articulating the ecological selves. Such ecological cells perceive their interaction with others as preservation and appreciation of all diverse ecological systems. Now, since identities are products of particular places and relationships, the lectures construct their identity as an indigenous primitive tribe who consider humanity as an extended community of other life forms and their ecologies. It is from them that we learn that by recognizing our connection to ecologies, the self becomes extended and inclusive. By uh, by developing ecological relations between ourselves and the ecology, we are more likely to transform our relationship with the other species as well. Thank you, ma'am. That's it. Okay, thank you for that wonderful presentation. So we now go to the second uh, presentation, that, and this will be about the trajectories of violence in the Northeast North India, yeah. estimating yeah. the existential spatial justice of indigenous people through state politics. And this will be given by Pranata Bhattacharya. Uh, I yes. hope I pronounced it correctly. Yes. Uh, an assistant yes. professor at Bankura University in India. Yes. You have uh, the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The leader is present here. And thank you to the organizers. Uh, my uh, topic is the trajectories of violence in the Northeast India, estimating the existential special justice of indigenous people through the state policies. So first, I would like to say that my uh, paper is more or less based on the pedagogical issues rather than uh, praxis oriented factors. It is a kind of uh, correlation of pedagogy and praxis. Uh, in case of Northeast India, we know that uh, Already many speakers have uh, spoken about Northeast India. Northeast India is a place for indigenous culture and you know different varieties of uh, lingual and uh, uh, cultural uh, traits are there. So uh, we know that uh, in a society where so many indigenous cultures are existent, it is very difficult to mandate the policies. So in case of Northeast India, this problem is same. And what is very much important even in this post-pandemic uh, situation, is the spatial justice that how much Northeast as a space or how much Northeastern people are uh, receiving spatial justice. So in this case, I would like to uh, draw my attention to the uh, Edward Soja's arguments about uh, 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 you know, defining space. Uh, Edward Soja wanted to define the space as a third space uh, which is related to uh, not only uh, a given reality of the state, uh, given reality of the people's lived experiences. Uh, it is also related to the cognitive mapping of the uh, cognitive mapping of, of the inhabitants, and it is also related to the uh, related to the uh, so-called imaginary, so-called narratives of the uh, uh, spatial configuration. As far as Northeast India is concerned, uh, it faced a lot of special reconfigurations and reconfigurations uh, because uh, India faced uh, partition and Northeast uh, was hit by uh, the situation as well. So uh, in this situation, uh, what happens? The space of the sense of living space were lost by the people of Northeast India in two terms, basically, either by the eviction due to the different uh, issues like ethnic clashes, etc., or 
due to the influx of the uh, so called foreigners into their own lands or into their own soils uh, in this situation what happens uh, that uh, indigenous people switch to the violence to stop uh, to to seek justice which is which, which is actually you know absent from their life so spatial justice is not a very easy thing to meet up uh, for this what is important that is proper governance and this governance should not take into consideration only the developmental factors what is the problem here in case of in, uh, indian policy government is imposing the structural the tenets of the structural adjustment and so called infrastructure projects are being implemented in the northeastern region rather than taking into considerations uh, the the people's cognitive mapping people's uh, people to people contact and people's desires of being treated that how they want to be treated so if, even if uh, the economic uh, projects are uh, projects are there uh, projects are booming uh, the barter ties and the kinship economy or the uh, micro level economy or the financial transactions are absolutely bad hit and in this post pandemic era what is uh, post pandemic era what is becoming very stark that is the racial uh, you know clashes racial violences because there is a concept of reverse migration that the indigenous people those who are those who were you know uh, out of the out of their land for uh, earning their livelihood they are now returning due to the lockdown process and that is why there are a lot of violence uh, issues otherwise uh, apart from this post pandemic thing not violence in trajectories of violence in north east india it is not a new thing it happened a lot uh, we know about the ethnic uh, clashes between naga kuti and uh, uh, the so called demands by the maitees uh, uh, maitees wanted inner line permit so that they can restrict the uh, settlements of the foreigners into their land so there is a fear of losing space uh, so when we talk about the geographic planning i think uh, rather than geography space plays uh, you know crucial role because space involves mental mapping not not only the given reality not only the econ geo economic space rather than it can involve the mental mapping as well so when uh, we are implementing the policies the policies should be in tandem uh, with with such kind of uh, you know spatial tendencies of uh, you know justice so in this case what is happening in case of indian uh, indian scenario indian government is implementing a uh, pro capitalist and uh, pro capitalist economic policies and i can explain it by the uh, uh, you know according to jemson's uh, three stages of uh, capitalist uh, development where the cap capitalism is getting in capitalism is getting introduced then it is uh, getting implemented and then it is getting consolidated so in this process what happens that uh, people find a new space and this new space is uh, nothing but a kind of quick saturating space where uh, you know how the space is getting filled that becomes very important so so in that case when space is quickly filling with the policies or the implications of those policies then what is getting remain what is getting ignored that is the people's aspirations that how they aspire to be treated in case of north east india it is very difficult to uh, you know uh, implement policies uh, because when we uh, implement uh, so called neo liberal structure uh, uh, this is a completely alien to the you know northeastern communities uh, they have their own differences and they are absolutely uh, you know repulsive to the uh, policies of structural adjustment so neo liberal structural adjustment is not a solution to their problems uh, we can see that recently indian government has announced blue kist and access policy so that uh, northeast india is becoming an economic hub and uh, connectivity projects uh, river connectivity uh, trade links uh, bim stick corridor etc different kinds of corridors but but the uh, problem lies that when it comes to the matter of migration when it comes to the matter of internally displaced people those who are affected by the government projects and policies these things are not getting addressed 
and their resettlement is not even an uh, not even and uh, and you no know, very astounding uh, issue i think because uh, the issues are not getting addressed properly as per their aspirations so their homeland imaginaries are getting hampered and in this situation i feel that what is the solution i think solution is democracy and democracy is uh, i i would like to uh, you know draw attention to the g bingham powell's contemporary democracy so there are three uh, there are three basic steps that control of violence voter turnout in elections government stability and i also uh, uh, you know uh, add uh, a few more points like overall uh, quality of the democracy because we know that uh, pranata you yes. only have two minutes please uh, start traveling up okay okay because uh, in in case of india democracy is implemented but it is not consolidated so when it comes to the plural societies like north east india or the plural uh, so many communities are you know creating a juxtaposition so in that situation democratic permutation and combination is the only solution and uh, through the public policies and through the coherent public policies that can be made thank you i rest my point here Okay, thank you very much for that very insightful uh, presentation. We now go to the third uh, paper. It will be Garasha, Tribe of Aravali Hills, and this will be presented by Sachin Yadubanshi, an assistant professor of Paru Institute of Design, Paru University, India. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I will, I will share the screen with Is it visible? Ah, uh, yes, it is. Okay, so uh, my paper is about uh, uh, Garasia tribe, uh, which is in Aravli uh, region of uh, Rajasthan. So first, I will start with that uh, introduction of Aravli mountain range. Uh, Aravli range, uh, the three fifty million years old mountain range, stretches uh, through a three hundred mile stretch. Uh, spreading across Haryana, Delhi, Rajasthan, and Gujarat in India, uh, it is a hub for flourishing biodiversity with diverse flora and fauna, uh, with animal like leopard, fox, uh, Indian pangolin, sloth, bear, uh, porcupine, along with quite a few reptiles and uh, birds, as well as herbs with medi medicinal proper properties such as amla, musli, and gugal. It is one of the largest source of natural. Uh, resources consisting of marble, sandstone, rock phosphate, copper, uh, in, in this region, and it is uh, well uh, well home to a number of indigenous communities like Gracia, Bhil, uh, Saharia, Mina, uh, and others. So, uh, indigenous community uh, led a traditional way life in proximity to nature. For example, uh, far away from that uh, chaos and destruction. Uh, that industrialization and capitalism have brought for the people in mainstream societies. They thrive in the lap of nature, uh, striving to protect their culture and uh, knowledge they have acquired in sustainable living, ethno botanical practices, etc. Uh, every tribe of Aravli is enriched with their own distinction, culture, custom, and rituals that can be identified with. Their festivals, language, music, costumes, food, uh, architecture. Uh, so first, uh, we will talk about a little bit about uh, this Gracia tribes, like uh, how how their lifestyle and all. Uh, one such tribe is Gracia tribe that is concentrated in the part of uh, southern Rajasthan, Udaipur, Sirohi, and Dun uh, Dungarpur districts. Basically, the term Gracia means forest dwelling people. Substantiating uh, their claim to be the original setters of the dense forest living in harmony with the nature for years. They are completely dependent on nature for their survival, 
uh, by foraging the uh, forest for food and medicine, uh, leading a life with least materialistic values. They have their distinct socio-cultural practices consisting of festivals, costumes, ornament, dance, music, uh, distinguish it from the other tribes in, in the same region. So in the lifestyle of uh, tri uh, Gracia tribe, the Gracia speak the Dungri language, which is a mix of Bhili, Marwadi, and Gujarati, which is that uh, nearby other uh, communities are speaking. So it's a mix of all these languages. And they have uh, their vibrant costumes with uh, different colors of headgear worn by men and different ages and status uh, known, known as uh, pagadi. So the women generally wear blue, red, and green colors garment with a sleeve jacket called zulki. The men and women uh, adorn themselves with ornament made of stone, cells, and bronze. The women are often interesting, interested in tattooing. And the women in the tri uh, tribe uh, enjoy equal status as the men. They are given the freedom to choose their partners. Uh, widowed remarriage uh, are accepted. So the couples is allowed in this tribe to live uh, live together until they choose choose to marry, which is a thousands of year old tradition. Uh, contemporary problems with the Gracia is like in the recent uh, chain of events, the traditional lifestyle of Gracia has been threatened by the growing industrialis industrialization, uh, urging them to migrate to the cities for survival. With, with gradual effect of climate change over the past years, a sharp dip in the rainfall has been observed. Large-scale mining and cement factories set up uh, have impacted in the degradation of the fields of the uh, Gracia farmers. In addition to this, the wa uh, water of the dams constructed by the government in many areas is diverted to the urban areas, depriving the Adivasis for the most basic necessity. The dam crisis. In the Jhadol Tessil of Udaipur district in Rajasthan, the Mansi Wakal Dam constructed on the land of displaced tribal failed to quench the thrust, thrust of uh, villagers, despite providing ample water to the Udaipur city daily. The dam that, according to the villagers, was built to satisfy the huge requirement of water by the established uh, plant of uh, Hindustan Zinc Limited continues to guzzle abundant uh, amounts of water daily. The neighboring villages suffer from the drought-like situation. The water level of the well has declined. The river have dried up due to less rainfall of as the villagers uh, flounder the attain enough water to their cattle and crops while the dam continues to serve the city. Force migration. Gracias unwillingly migrate to the cities for work in order to sustain themselves. These mi uh, migrant workers end up working as daily wage laborers on mining sites. So the tribal who were considered the pres preserver of the nature end up exploiting the same, causing permanent damage to the bio biodiversity and the land by working in the mining sites. Uh, Pathar Gadai is uh, stone carving or Pathar Gadai is the most flourishing sector of business uh, in, in that part of Rajasthan. So uh, the majority of the workforce is drawn from the indigenous community, including the migrants of the Gracia tribe. These stone carvers uh, serve the temple building enterprises that, that is one of the largest industries in the area operating through religious trust and societies or indirectly through subcontracting. Pindwara. Pindwara is, is a small uh, town in uh, in the Sirohi district. Uh, nearby, this all the tribes is, is settled. So where the workers use the cheapest of the machinery to, to carve magnificent statues and pillars from the block of marble stone. So Pindwara is a, is a hub for that uh, stone carving and, and this Pathargadai work. Owing to the lack of any, any skill or education, the migrant workers are forced to perform intensive physical work for an inadequate income. The marble that these workers carve uh, for about eight hours on a daily basis is enriched with the uh, hazardous uh, substance called silica that the workers are exposed to while cutting, crushing, and polishing the marble stones. The silica is the dust in ultra fine and cannot be filtered with, with the use of cheap and ordinary masks, occasionally worn by the laborers. 
Uh, along with sil silicosis, the worker are also prone to be exposed to several, uh, several other al alignment uh, related to eyes uh, and such temporary blindness caused by the solar radiation reflected from the marble surfaces. From, the, from, from my field visit, uh, on a visit to Pindwara Tehsil of Rajasthan, I came across with Vaktaram Gracia, a migrant labor from the Gracia community who had worked as a stone carver for about 15 years of his life. Inhaling the dust of silica for the long has completely damaged both of his... I'm sorry life. to interrupt, Asachin. You have two minutes to wrap up your presentation. Thank you. Okay, okay. so on this field visit, uh, the, the, the dust released from the cement uh, cements industries, containment, the agriculture land, uh, these factories required a great deal of water. So the all water is supplied to all these industries. And uh, in the name of God, like all these workers are uh, like convinced in the name of enough God because they are uh, making all these statues for the gods. So before that, I want to one, one more thing, like uh, around 3,500 machines are day, uh, daily being operated in Pindwara for about seven to eight hours. And uh, according to, to health uh, department, uh, in the Pindwara region, it, it is estimated that around 35% of the workers were found to be in, infected with the silica. So my conclusion is the identity of the Gracia tribe is deeply rooted in the history in the hills of uh, Arauli, which has become an inseparable part of being of its being, thus separating the two not only rob, robs the community of its identity but also endangers the Arauli hills. The hills has been impeccably exploited in the name of development and economic upliftment, while it is only the people of Gracia who can restore and protect the Arauli hills. The destruction of Arauli not only resulted in the loss of ecology but also the local art and culture of the of its inhabitants the gross profit made from the marble industry ironically uh, it is enough to make the safety equipment available to workers the greed of the industry overlooks the value of uh, lives of the workers merely treating them as working hands thank you okay thank you very much for sharing your insights and so we go to the fourth uh, panelist we have Solomon Islari, and uh, he'll be presenting our women victims of patriarchal social system in the process of witch hunting, analysis with reference to BTAD. And Solomon is an assistant professor at the Department of Political Science at Bodolan University in India. Please take the floor. Thank you, madam. So uh, I'm going to present a paper. I think, am I audible? Hello? Hello? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to present a paper. So uh, uh, the paper that I'm going to present is Are Women Victim of Patriarchal Social System, the Process of Witch Hunting, an Analysis with Reference to BTAD. So when we do talk about the crime and violence against women, some of the conventional crime that uh, uh, has been going through uh, so uh, through centuries. If we do see uh, somewhat what we say, uh, such as rape or maybe uh, uh, some kind of physical assault or say it domestic violence, there are many such crime that is happening against women. But uh, beyond it, beyond it, if we do see one such crime that has been continuing so uh, in relation to crime against women is witch hunting. So I would generally like to see witch hunting in the perspective uh, or in the line of feminism, or uh, which, we would, uh, which I would like to say that's the feminist perspective of witch hunting in that very line. So somewhere uh, are women simply becoming victims of this witch hunting uh, so, as a result of this patriarchal social system, this is what uh, I would like to uh, try to analyze it, try to analyze it. So, uh, let's just go to it. So, 
Witch hunting, a social evil, has uh, been prevalent in most of the traditional societies. It is based on superstitious belief, hanging in the balance of might and realities. Somewhere it is uh, hanging in the might or reality in that way. The, uh, the terms as as uh, witching, witch doctors, witch mongers, black magic, spell, witch finder are some of the terms that are quite relevant in most of the traditional societies. And there are different theories to it. There are different theories to the origin of witch hunting or witch. Feminist perspective believe that witch hunting is related with assigning of gender role in the society. Feminism generally believe that witch hunting uh, somewhat it originated when society began to segregate the gender role in the society, gender role in the society, as it is somewhat being determined by the patriarchal social system. Uh, the devolution of social role of women, where women are immediate victim of this very system. Somewhere uh, when we do give role to women, so women are uh, becoming a scapegoat to these practices of witch hunting, witching, or any other thing. So we are targeting, we are targeting them in one way or other, knowingly or unknowingly. So there are many theories, feminist theories, who generally say that somewhat uh, witch hunting in one way or another, in one way or another, we have deprived women of their medical practices and forced them to submit to patriarchal control of nuclear family. This is uh, being stated by Mary Daly or Carlin Marsen or many other uh, scholars in line of uh, this uh, uh, witch hunting from the feminist line. They generally say that somewhere the patriarchal control or nuclear society has directly or indirectly resulted in terming women as witch or targeting them as witch or witches. And then the here somewhere it has destroyed the holistic concept. And I would also like to uh, go on to other what we do say uh, theories as well. So in relation to feminist perspective itself, so uh, Liva, which witchcraft, women and society in uh, one of the world, so has generally focused two approaches focus two approaches. So she had a question and the question is, why are women uh, yeah, uh, popular targets during witch hunting? In this introductory section, Levesque raises the critical point, which says in all contexts has traditionally been women. Somewhere it has been focused here. He says that somewhere women in most of the traditional societies are being targeted as which first he assumes that women have typically participated in role as traditional heroes or midwives or a cult leaders or something in that way. And this very thing has itself in the due course of time has somewhat uh, within the boundary of the patriarchal society, uh, somewhat this thing has led to uh, targeting of women as which. And uh, the second approach that we do have is the second approach emphasized the belief that women, because they are considered to be morally weaker than men and more susceptible to the uh, advances of devil and therefore practices of witchcraft more frequently and therefore practice witchcraft more frequently than men. And another belief that is there is that somewhat women are considered as somewhat morally more weaker than men and they are more likely likely to be closer to evil devil and all and therefore somewhat in due course of witch hunting or witching or witch hunting and all somewhat women are generally being targeted terming them to be practicing witch or uh, or they uh, somewhat practicing evil activity and all. This is what has uh, been stated. This is what has been stated. And then, so uh, I would also like to go on to uh, the other uh, perspective within feminist perspective itself. So different Richard, so uh, yeah, individual doing research on witchcraft or witch hunting, somewhat they believe 
this very witch hunting is uh, related with uh, fertility religion or cult so to increase fertility of men women of their community so they try to apply uh, so uh, sorcery so which led to witchcraft so somewhat here as well again so it is believed that in one way or other it is related with fertility of religion or simply cult so it's related with it and in due course of in order to increase the fertility rate and all somewhere it is seen that women being what we would say in the center of it women beings in the center of it so from analyzing the above perspective of witch and witch hunting so about the origin of the witches which scrap its hunt there uh, after one can very well assign that women are soft target to the practices in the process of witch hunting men symbolizes the witch uh, witch finder what has happened here is that men generally uh, is being symbolized as the witch finder we generally say it as a good witch good good so one who practices as good witching and all and then women are generally being assigned the negative side of it that we do say the bad witch bad witch so this is what has been stated she was being termed as evil women were presumed to be witches and were be sect and persecuted for I'm sorry to interrupt uh, you have 2 minutes to please uh, wrap up your presentation thank you so much yeah and in doing so when we do talk about assam so assam generally is stated as a land of uh, 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 yeah sorcery or land of uh, uh, witching and all if we do see or from ancient time assam is generally being popularly known as the land of magic or sorcery we say it in that way and then whereby it is directly or indirectly related with our social system mainly among bodos missing gauri a home or tree tribes or tree tribes other community do as well practices this uh, thing and in one way or other most of the victim that uh, has come up that has come up that has come up uh, so if we do see the record from 2001 to 2017 there were in and around 100 and uh, 193 people were being killed by turning them to be a switch out of it 114 women uh, were being killed as switch and 79 men were being killed as switch now if we do analyze this very data that is very much available and that was being put up in the assam state assembly and also being given by what we do say additional director general of police if we do see it somewhat we find that women are directly or indirectly victims of witch hunting as us to say it that in one way or other so the patriarchal social system that we do have is directly or indirectly related with terming women as witch and ultimately so women are becoming scapegoat or they are becoming easy target just in order to uh, in order to either grab property or silly in way or pity quarrel or some kind of political murder thank you all of you for listening to me thank you very much for the enlightening uh, talk and we now go to the last uh, presentation and uh, it will be on indigenous farming systems uh, practice in nagaland india a sustainable approach and please help me out on how to correctly say your name yeah chumdung muri okay chumdung muri and and chumdung uh, muri is the uh, a scholar at the department of agricultural economics at nagaland uh, university in india so you have the floor now yeah yeah i'll start uh, presenting Uh, give me a minute. Okay, and while we're waiting, you can uh, actually post uh, your questions if you have uh, thought of any question for the the past four uh, speakers. The chat box is available for you to write down your thoughts or your questions while we're waiting Excuse for. Me? Yes. Sure, ma'am. I yes, do not able to share share my screen. Uh, you need to click on the present now. Yeah, yeah, I clicked. 
And then you need to choose uh, which uh, um, screen or is it the whole screen? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. No, you okay, there it is. Yeah, yeah. I hope my slide is visible. Yes, it is, but uh, we don't see any text at the moment. Oh, okay, I hope it will come. Can you see my slide? Um, it's just a clear, uh, just white uh, screen. If there's no text, <coughs> but if you can uh, like do the introduction while we're waiting for your presentation to come up. Okay, okay. Uh, so thank you very much for the time, uh, Chairwoman and uh, the organizer. Today I'll present my paper entitled Indigenous Farming System Practices in Nagaland, a Sustainable Approach. My name is Nchumdung Murray. I'm a research scholar in the Department of Agricultural Economics, Nagaland University. Uh, I hope my screen is visible by now. Uh, we still don't see any text. Okay, can I, uh, can I share once more? Yes, please. Okay, we still don't see any uh, presentation. Uh, uh, sorry for that. But if it didn't show, I'll just continue without the slide. Okay, we, we see now, but uh, we still see just the screen, not the presentation. Uh, it's your, your screen. Uh, then can I just go with, without showing the screen? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, okay. There it is now. Oh, just have thank you very two. much. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in introduction, I can say that uh, in Nagaland, uh, that is the northeastern part of India, chum cultivation or shifting cultivation is widely practiced. And not only in the northeastern region, but even in Nagaland also, as yes, it is inhibited mostly by the tribal people Chum cultivation or shifting cultivation, so as we say, it's very, um, very much in practice. And as we know, this indigenous practice is not uh, not advisable in terms of uh, in terms of uh, its uh, damage to the ec ecology and our environment. So over the years, uh, tribal farmer in the northeastern state of India adopted many alternative farming practices which evolved through their farming experience or their inherent skills that suits their local topography, that suits their climatic condition and so on. Coming to Nagaland, uh, Nagaland is a mountainous state in the northeastern region of India. About 71% 70, of the population is dependent on agriculture and agriculture 
and allied activities as per 2001 census. Different sustainable indigenous farming practice and knowledge exists among the tribals of Nagaland and is considered as their way of life by many tribal communities. Chum cultivation practice in Nagaland and other hill region of India, as I've mentioned, and it is not advisable uh, in terms of scientific point of view because of its environmental and ecological hazards. Uh, in this paper, I'll try to elaborate the old age indigenous farming practice, namely the alder based farming system and, and the terrace, terrace rice cultivation practice, which is a kind of substitute far farming system for uh, the old age tradition practice of uh, shifting cultivation, which is uh, being practiced since time immemorial by tribals in Nagaland. Uh, the first one is uh, the alder based farming system. And uh, I'll, I'll go ahead with the uh, terrace rice cultivation. Uh, alder based farming system, in alder based farming system, an alder, an alder tree is grown uh, just like in a, in a regular shifting cultivation, an alder tree is introduced in the, in the farming system and it is commonly practiced in the Koima and Peg district of Nagaland. In this system of farming, crops are grown as intercrop with an alder tree. Uh, the indigenous, the indigenous alder-based farming system is an efficient system of sustainable agriculture farming system developed and practiced since time immemorial by tribals in Nagaland. As, as alder tree has a potential of uh, growing or thriving in a less fertile and degraded soil, it is found most suitable tree to, to incorporate in our tomb land. Taking advantage of the ability of the alder tree to fix atmospheric nitrogen and also its ability to produce a large biomass that enriches the soil, this alder, alder tree is widely in use. In this system of farming, the seedling of the alder tree are blended in the tomb field with a wide spacing of approximately four meter between the plant and five meter between the row, depending on the slope of the land. The slope of the land is very important while, uh, while choosing for the uh, distance, distance while blending. Uh, and uh, this alder tree is introduced in the, in the land growing system by the farmers. The alder tree is allowed, allowed to grow and in the first year, the, the primary crop there is rice and other secondary crops, which includes colocasia, tomato, chili, tabuca, potato, etc., are introduced along with rice. And this, this is a kind of mixed farming system where in one piece of land, different crops are grown all together. And in the second and the third year, the same growing pattern is followed because in the first year we blended the alder tree, it, it's allowed to grow and the alder tree haven't reach the haven't attained the um, optimum height for bollarding. Uh, in the second and the third year, the same cropping pattern is followed in the same land, and subsequently, tomb land is left uncultivated for about three to four years in order to allow the tree to attain certain height and rough fissure on the bark. And the bollarding operation is usually done when the alder tree is around five to six years old. By five to six year old, the alder tree will attain uh, an approximate ball circumference of uh, 10 to 100 centimeter. And the main rung of the tree is cut horizontally at the height of at the height of two meter above the ground. The alder tree is bollarded or cut cut down followed by covering the exposed portion of the trunk with a mud and straw to avoid losses of sap and drying. This uh, process is also very important because if we just polar the alder tree and if we just leave unattended, because of the sap flow or because of over drying, the alder tree will die off. A small sto stone slab is placed on the cover portion of the trunk so as to facilitate the uniform sprouting of new shoots. 
in the first year after after bollarding, uh, the sprouted shoots are allowed to grow and for and from the second and the subsequent year, few healthy shoots are retained and pruned. Uh, except for a few healthy healthy shoots, shoots, other other branches or other shoots are again cut cut off from the main trunk. These shoots are allowed to grow till the next tomb cycle, and the same process is repeated. The prune branches are used for domestic foil wood, which also have a lot of economic value. In uh, traditional nag naga kitchen, this uh, foil wood is uh, commonly used, so it has lots of economic value. Uh, Alder best tomb cultivation can it can reduce the fellow burrow and increase the year of production as compared to the natural tomb cycle. Usually in uh, in the normal tomb cycle, it takes seven to nine years, but uh, with this uh, new system called the Alder Best Farming System, the tomb cycle is reduced to four to five years. The, sim the symbiotic relationship between Alder tree with nitrogen fixing ectimonas Echinomycetes of the genus Frangia has also been recognized by some tribe of the farmer in Nagaland. And alder best farming system is a practice is in practice for a long time because of its potential in fixing uh, atmospheric nitrogen that enriches the soil and also uh, in providing uh, because of its ability to produce of uh, huge biomass. Besides fixing atmospheric nitrogen, the, the litter added to the soil provides phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and other nitrogen through the addition of biomass. And uh, the, the second one is the terrace rice cultivation. Terrace rice cultivation is a system of uh, irrigated agriculture of growing rice, traditionally known as panikiti in Nagaland. This is a Nakamis term. And Banikiti is successfully practiced in Koyuma and Peg district of Nagaland, and in it is practiced all over Nagaland. But uh, and it is practiced in other parts of northeastern region also. But it I'm is sorry to interrupt, uh, Yeah, yeah. So you have two minutes to please wrap up your presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Banikiti is uh, actually in Banikiti the. Uh, the pedi is mostly grown, but after pedi, uh, after harvesting of pedi, different cropping systems are introduced in in, in, in the same field. Uh, terrace rice cultivation of pedi is done on the terrace in the hill slope with a let down, with a let down terrace with imponding of water brought from the upstream. Terrace mostly constructed in the area having clay soil of good water holding capacity. Good quality terrace are constructed even on the high steep terrain up to one 100% one slope and or even more. Terrace could retain water level be, between 8 to 12 centimeter deep, depending upon the height of the shoulder pond. In this system, the supply of water should be ensured after the blending of the rice from the upstream uh, irrigation canal, in which water fits the bedi field at a lower elevation. In this system of pedi cultivation, mostly local, local and land rest variety of rice are grown by the farmer, depending on the preferences of preferences for family consumption and adaptability of the crop to the climate and other factor. Planting of pedi generally starts in the month of May, June, and the harvesting is done in during late October and it continues till November. So, in conclusion, I could say that indigenous farming system, which has been in practice by the farmer of Farmer of Nagaland uh, is found to be sustainable and profitable. Indigenous farming practice, which the farmer adopt based on the in, in, which the farmer adopt based on their in, inherent knowledge, are uh, suitable to the regional topography and climatic condition. Need an extensive research to yield significant significant outcome. However, very few studies are available, and thus need research extension intervention in promoting and address the research gap in such indigenous farming practices. Indigenous farming, uh, farming practices by the tribal farmer 
has promising future if exploited with proper research strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all the presenters. And uh, I'm very happy for this uh, panel because I see so many similarities uh, between the situation of indigenous peoples of India and also the Philippines. So if you have any questions, you can um, type uh, at our chat box and uh, I'll just uh, refresh you all of uh, the presentation. So um, Dr. Rossi Chumbling uh, discussed greeting identity, rereading Lepcha folklore, and uh, we were introduced of the Lepcha tribe and uh, nature worship as in an integral part of their uh, primitive culture. Um, we also heard Apanata Patacharya on the trajectories of violence in the Northeast uh, India, estimating the ex existential spatial justice of indigenous people through state um, policies. And uh, she defined the spatial justice and also the um, reconfigurations of this uh, concept, as well as the um, shared some insights on Indian policy in terms of ad addressing the injustice uh, trajectories. And then we also have Asachin who uh, introduced us to the Garash, uh, Grasha tribe of Aravalli Hills and uh, also the, um, discussed the indigenous practices of protecting their environment and uh, the contemporary problems that they are facing, um, especially on their health and environment. And then we have uh, a presentation of Solomon on uh, this is on the situation of women experiencing crime or uh, violence uh, related to uh, patriarchy and uh, uh, gave us a context, uh, historical context of the gender uh, roles by uh, rooting the practice of witch hunting on the views we have on women as well as the roles assigned to women and then last but not least uh, we have known the indigenous farming practice in nagaland and uh, uh, and Chum Tung, uh showed us the use of the alder tree as an indigenous farming practice as well as the benefits of using this and integrating this into the uh, into the farming system. So if you have any questions in mind, you can uh, do so now. And while waiting, I'll, I'll start uh, asking the, the panelists. So uh, this will be for Dr. Uh, Rosie Chumling. I I'm just uh, wondering on, on the, the effect of Christianity into this uh, nature worship. Um, because you have mentioned that uh, a lot of them actually have um, converted to Christianity. So I'm wondering if there is any um, like forms of hybridity with their practice. Uh, 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 I wish to say that basically these lectures are animist. Uh, practitioners of nature worship or nature worshippers, but uh, gradually in the eighth century, when Guru Padma Sambhava introduced Buddhism in, uh, you know, in Sikkim, uh, these lecture tribesmen were also inducted into the Buddhist fold, and uh, with the coming of, you know, with the coming of, um, uh, you know, the Britishers, the East India Company in India, they, uh, you know, they were further subjected to you know to the influence of christianity now uh, these lectures like uh, uh, what what we see the present uh, you know uh, scenario contemporary scenario is that like uh, uh, the, these lectures who were you know who were uh, practicing the buddhist faith we see that uh, you know they were treated uh, not at par with the tibetan buddhist or uh, you know, uh, the Tibetan Buddha, they were, they were actually treated as second class Buddhist. And gradually, because Buddhism came with so much of its own paraphernalia, like because it was more an expensive kind of a ritual that they followed. And as a result, Christianity was more all embracing. So, uh, you know, because of the influence also of the Britishers coming in, most of these lectures have, you know, have embraced Christianity because it promised them a better mode of living. Now, um, uh, but then we see that in spite of embracing Buddhism, these lectures still in Sikkim, they still continue to revere mm. and respect their traditional roots. That's what we see in, in, in Sikkim, at least. 
talking about. Oh, that's very interesting uh, insight. And uh, we also have a question here. Um, okay, this is addressed to Mr. Murray. And uh, there's a, a comment here that's it's a very insightful uh, paper. How far government is contemplating or implementing sustainable resource management and indigenous knowledge? Uh, am I audible? Hello, ma'am. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Brananda Bhattacharya, for that question. Uh, actually, I'm yes. a researcher. It's, I, it's, it's a query. It's a query. It's not a question, really. So, if you can share your insights and yeah, yeah, I'm a researcher and I presented the paper in the and uh, as a in a researcher perspective, but. Uh, as far as the, how far the government is contemplating on implementing sustainable resource management and indigenous knowledge, this one I could say that uh, the government are making a tremendous stride in in, this, uh, in maintaining this sustainability approach in farming because in context of Nagaland, is mainly the shift of the indigenous practice. Practice and government are making every effort to increase uh, shifting elevation or elevation and in order to uh, someone is from external background. It will be very interesting if uh, if more research is carried out on this kind of topic about the indigenous farming system, which the uh, farmer they used to develop through their experiences. And these things are sustainable, sustainable in nature. Therefore, um, what I would say is, government are also making an uh, effort to reduce uh, shifting elevation, and in that way, uh, the the farmers are taking up this uh, sustainability approach in farming. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that uh, question. question. And uh, do you still have? Uh, Okay, so we have another question. This is from Henry Kuss, um, Yulianto, and thanks to all presenters. Very wonderful and enriching presentations. I have a question to Sachin. Is the Gresha indigenous community a minor group in India, and how do the government and people in general interact with them? Sachin? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so that that gracia is uh, used to be in forest earlier, but now that all these like uh, all their uh, agriculture and all these things are are reduced, so they migrated to to the nearby towns and cities, and the mm. like. Uh, there are uh, government programs are going on, but not to preserve any any their way of living. They also like uh, try to uh, move them to the mainstream society. Okay, uh, can I do a follow up question on that? Because I also have a question. I'm interested with this. Uh, um, because we, we, we have some similar um, situation here, like especially in mining communities. Um, I'm just interested on how do um, they, they view like their community as doing the, 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 that economic activity, like the sustainability of their environment and especially of their, their tribe uh, with that kind of situation in a mining uh, community, because we know the, um, the effects of of mining uh, in their health and the, in their environment, if they are the ones um, like uh, doing the economic work, uh, how that align with their being indigenous peoples, uh, with their own traditional practices. So, can you can you repeat the main question? Um, yeah, the, the main question that I have is that uh, how does their uh, their traditional way of living, uh, their indigenous practices. I, I'm not sure if they have this uh, traditional mining practices, because no. uh, in in uh, in some communities that uh, we have here in the Philippines, we do have communities that have this traditional way of mining. I'm not just sure if that's similar to this kind of strain, and no. uh, that's why 
some of the, the, the environmental effects are mitigated by their own practices. Do they have similar um, experience in your, in your study? No, no, they don't have like a traditional way of mining. They traditionally they are doing the farming only, but uh, okay. like now, 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 nowadays, like they all are doing that stone carving. So that stone is like the huge market. So okay. that's and they are very perfect in that carving because of their way of like art, art and culture. Like they know how to stone carving since ages. So they use all these mi migrant workers. Uh, into that industry. Okay, I think this is also a follow-up question on that. Uh, what is the nature of Russia labor? Are they bonded or free laborers? Uh, this is from Parvat. What? what is? Uh, it's uh, in the chat. Uh, what is the nature of Russia labor? Are they bonded or free laborers? Like, uh, do they work for a company? Uh, is there like a, a private mining company there or like a private... Uh, they, um yeah 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 they they are doing in in private companies yeah. as, a, as a daily wage labor like they go and they work because they don't have because the old water and supply is set up stopped by the dam so what uh, they they don't have any option to do the agriculture and all these things so they have to have to have come out forcefully from that uh their like uh their own pattern of living yes Okay, well, thank you very much for those uh, insights. So uh, if you have other questions, you can uh, type them here at the chat box. Uh, I have a question for Solomon. Um, because you mentioned the, the tagging of, of the place uh, in Assam as the place of um, witchery or uh, witchcraft. Um, I'm, I'm just interested on who does the tagging. Like, who, who categorizes them as such? Um, Solomon? Yeah, can you repeat your question, madam? I am today. Okay, so the, the question that I have is that who does the tagging uh, in the, the area as a place of witchery? Uh, because you mentioned in your presentation that that area in Assam has been uh, tagged as a place of uh, witchery. So I'm interested on who does the tagging. Like, is it okay. self ascription? Do they, uh, like themselves, uh, have ascribed to that tag? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. So, uh, what happened here is that, madam, uh, in this very place, since uh, Assam, we generally know that it is a land of magic or treasury, maybe intention day. So the people have been practicing black magic and all. So this is what the belief that we do have. And then in this sort of time, what we have seen here is that the concept of good with and black with is not very much relevant here. So we do have some people within the community who generally so you know that someone is speaking against you or someone is performing some kind of uh, Evil act against you or using evil against you. So there are some, uh, what we, in local term, we say them as uh, some kind of Oda or Gaydini and all. This will form. This will form what we do, some kind of uh, uh, enchantment or something in that way. So for so. And ultimately, the community, somewhat, uh, what they do here is that they either excommunicate sometimes. Or sometimes in instances there are be, uh, what we they say those who are being termed to be practicing uh, wits are being killed or somewhat there uh, comes up some kind of physical assault. So uh, and then uh, somewhat what we do say there are also instances where uh, yeah people are compelled to uh, leave leave the villages where they are there and uh, hardly. I think it was only in 2015 that uh, in Assam we had a law against witch hunting. It came up only by 2015. Earlier, we did not have any such law, and therefore there was no categorization. So uh, this is about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for those insights. Uh, do you still have uh, questions from uh, the chat box here? I don't see. Uh, it's uh, all uh, thanking the the present centers so 
I think we only have like a minute uh, <laughs> before the session. So yes, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ma'am Doris P. Wilson, uh, for chearing the session and managing the session so well. Thank you so thank much. You.